Hi everybody, I'm John Iverson. I'm the host of this weekly video series. Uh, I'll look back at the week in Canadian politics. Uh, joining me are Andrew Balfour, who's the managing partner of Rubicon Strategies, and Marcella Monroe, who is the owner-operator of WPM Public Affairs. And over the course of the next 15 minutes, we'll reveal why absolutely all of our elected leaders are complete idiots and why we, sh and why we should be running the country if we could be bothered. That is actually more bravado than I currently feel. Um, everything seems to be so confusing at the moment. It was actually a relief um, to have the entire planet fixated on this giant boat stuck in the canal, because at least it was something that uh, was, was easily understood. What I'm less, uh, having less success with is the COVID advice coming from various quarters. Um, you know, we, we talked last week about awarding an Omni Shambles of the Week award, and it would seem to be that when you have the National Advisory Council on Immunization recommending a pause in the use of AstraZeneca's vaccine because it might cause blood clots, and at the same time, Health Canada still recommending that the benefits outweigh the risks, and Justin Trudeau weighing in saying that people should just take the first vaccine that is offered to them, that would seem to me to be a little bit confusing for people. Andrew, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's more than just everything happening around vaccines. I think that it's confusing for, you know, we hear people say, oh, the rules keep changing. I can't figure it out. Well, within 30 seconds of a Google search, you could figure it out. Like I could just type in Ottawa COVID rules and figure it out pretty fast. So I guess people are pretty Well, fast. so for example, though, today, uh, uh, Ontario's come into a new lockdown. Quebec has gone back into the red zone. I don't know whether I can get a haircut or not. No, you cannot. No, I can't. No. But you could have Googled that and found out pretty fast. But I think people are getting fed up, Marcella. Don't you think that, that um, you know, this, this constant whiplash leaves people feeling that, um, you know, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Plus, you know, the longevity of it and the fact that some people have been vaccinated. Yeah, well, I think that's very much the case. I, I think it's, it's messages from all different levels of government on different pieces of this. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, different rules and regulations depending on where you are. Um, I think it's the fatigue, though, is really setting in. And we know people's mental health is just <laughs> getting worse and worse. Uh, so I don't, I, I'm a little bit worried about what happens this weekend as we head into Easter, because honestly, I just know a lot of people that have kind of had it. And in my neighborhood here in Toronto, anyway, like I went out to run a couple errands, you wouldn't, re except for the masks, you wouldn't really know it wasn't kind of a normal day. So I think that that's part of the challenge for sure. I mean, we're looking at the, the federal political consequences of this. Um, you know, we've got 14% of the population is now has a first shot at least. Only 1.7% has is fully vaccinated. Um, I think the best thing that can be said is we're, we're fourth in the world when it comes to countries that begin with C, behind the Cayman Islands, the Chile and the Czech Republic. I mean, is, is the federal government out of the woods here? It, it, it always seems to be it's jammed tomorrow. I don't think they're out of the woods. I mean, until there's a, every single Canadian has been, who wants to be has been vaccinated, they're not out of the woods. And I mean, I also think that it's starting to get a little ridiculous, this back and forth game that's going on between the premiers and the feds and everyone pointing a finger at each other. Like, I think that the politics of that are lost on your average person who just wants a vaccine and would rather the governments be spending their time getting them vaccinated than babbling about like who did what first like it's almost childish to this point I think, that, I think that's right i think that um you know this week we had this press conference with 20 politicians to announce that we're going to get a vac uh, a vaccine manufacturer here that will open in is it 2026 or 2027 and the way they were all celebrating themselves and telling each other what a great job they're doing and how great it is to work with them and kind of this cheerleading stuff I, I, I mean most canadians don't watch news 24 7 like some like like probably the us three nerds but i just think that's so out of touch like you, you can't take a victory lap right now and think that anyone's gonna give you a pat on the back when no one seems to be able to figure out when or how they get vaccinated it's crazy let's move on also COVID related and one of the most counterintuitive things i think is that uh, we've seen a housing boom 
um, you know, while unemployment was at 10 percent and, and many people were temporarily at least laid off, 9.5 million households are seeing the wealth effect of a 17 percent rise in, in house prices. Um, you know, in many markets, that is a six figure increase in wealth if if it holds. Um, do you think Canadians are feeling good about their well-being, Marcella? Well, I think we know that they're not, by and large. Um, I've been working a bit with the Prosperity Project, as just volunteering, and we did some research with Polaris. So we know, for instance, that working women with kids in particular um, are very, very stressed out. And about 40% of Canadians that we polled also said that they've gone into debt and or used up all their savings. So I think what you're seeing is a real bifurcation, right? There's, there's a group of people that have done super well during the pandemic because they haven't been able to do anything but work and get paid at home. Um, and then there's another group of people who are just strugg were struggling to kind of make it and this pandemic has just put them totally off course. Uh, so I think the housing thing is, is, is very relevant because, you know, I feel like we're just, you know, it's the, it's the rich getting richer. Now, whether that holds remains to be seen, right? B was it BMO this week that put out a memo basically saying someone's got to calm this down, like this is irrational. Um, so yeah, you know, you've probably, if, if you're a homeowner, if you're lucky enough to be one and you've gained that percentage, I mean, I guess you can sell and make some money, but then what are you going to do? <laughs> but, but Andrew, that's, I mean, two thirds of, of households are homeowners, which means it's not just the rich getting richer, it's, it's the middle class, which is what Justin Trudeau said he was trying to help out. So, I mean, we're seeing a stability in support for the Liberal Party. There was an abacus poll today that put them eight points ahead. Um, do people just look at their own, their own personal circumstance and just tune out all the noise? I, I do think that COVID has made a lot of people a lot more selfish than they might have been before. Uh, and not being exposed to as many people, probably you're kind of living in your own bubble a bit more than you would have before. But, I mean, there's constant media reports about, oh, this house had multiple bids and went $400,000 over ask. Well, I would argue that that actually has much more to do with irresponsible real estate agents putting prices up that are way lower than they should be so that they can then go to their next client and say, oh, I sold this house for $400,000 over ask. It's like, well, maybe you priced it that way. Like, you're not that smart, buddy. <laughs> Come on now. And, and while we might have two-thirds homeowners, though, I think we we do need to recognize that doesn't mean there isn't an actual housing crisis, right? And we also no, no, don't, for sure there is, for sure. Right, and we also don't yet know what the long-term financial impact of COVID will be. Uh, in other words, it takes a long time to foreclose on someone, <laughs> right? So we might not be in the bottom end of that. I mean, the, the main cause of the house price increases is a, a lack of supply. So for sure, we have a housing issue. Um, but on the longer term economic consequences. The parliamentary budget officer came out with a report on Wednesday, which was pretty, pretty buoyant. I mean, it said that uh, he sees growth of 5.6% in uh, 2021, the employment rate reaching the pre-pandemic level this year, the unemployment rate going back to where it was pre-pandemic by, by next year. I mean, it does look like Canada has emerged I wouldn't say unscathed because we're, we've got a, a debt to GDP ratio of 50%, but um, given the servicing costs are relatively low, we look like we're on a reasonable trajectory as long as, and this is the point he made, um, you don't start establishing uh, permanent programs with the $100 billion in stimulus money that, that um, Christy Freeland is likely to bring down. So what do you think, Andrew? Is the, does the economic situation look relatively rosy, given, given all that we've been through? Well, I think that we both took the same point out of that report, that you can't have long-term, like, you can go and spend this money right now, but you can't make any kind of long-term anything out of it, or you're going to just continue to perpetuate the situation. You can use it as stimulus, but, you know, and this government will create some things, it'll have some little pet projects, we all know that. Um, but they can't get too carried away and go and create things that are, you know, almost call it legacy pieces that are going to cost the Canadian tax base money for a decade because we do need to rebound. And there's going to be such a incredible desire from Canadians to get out and do things when this is over. You know, I'm, I plan to live on airplanes for 
a year. Right, but so why do why would we need stimulus? Would be my question. But Marcella, I mean, their their main goal, let's face it, politically, is to kill the NDP. So that requires spending money on things the NDP would would it's, advocate for. They're doing a good job at that themselves. Don't worry. <laughs> They've been mowing the NDP's grass for a few years now, so you know I expect the beatings to continue. Um, but you know, I think I think that's all true. Uh, you know, and obviously. Um, you know, I, I don't take issue with anything in that report, but I would say this, there's still, I, I, I hate to sound like a broken record, but there, we have a very serious challenge with women in this economy, right? And so if I'm the federal government, yeah, I don't want a bunch of pet projects. I was kind of wondering to myself, like, what are we getting out of a $400 million investment in big pharma? Like that seemed a little shocking to me. <laughs> but on the other hand, like we do need to do better on a bunch of key files as we've learned through the pandemic. Women are still gonna want some kind of childcare help. We still need to deal with this challenge with the LT, with the long-term care facilities. Obviously, we're not taking good care of our seniors. So, I think the government's got it. Got to be careful, obviously, but they should also be taking care of the real problems that this pandemic has shown us. Well, just one quick thing there. I mean, and I yell at the TV every time your leader goes on talking about this. The federal government has nothing to do with long-term care. Jagmeet should remind himself that he's in Ottawa, and not Toronto anymore. Or, or childcare, for that matter. I mean, if yeah. you remember back when uh, Ken Dryden tried to get childcare introduced, right. he had to do deals with all of the provinces, and eventually Quebec said, "Yeah, well, we'll take your money, but uh, we're not doing anything. We're not taking national standards." I, I take your point that we need to do it. I mean, I think everybody uh, agrees that uh, we need to get more women back in the workforce. But um, whether a national childcare strategy is going to be quick and easy is another matter. My leader is Rachel Notley, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, she might be able to do something about it. She, we did just, do something in Alberta, but that's a different story. Just rounding off one of the stories of the week, um, and it's a procedural story, uh, which normally sends people uh, to sleep. But um, in this case, the precedent is uh, uh, was pretty cataclysmic for the opposition parties. And that's the, the, the opposition parties want senior political aides to be called before parliamentary committees that are looking at the wee scandal and at uh, sexual misconduct in the military. Uh, the Liberal Party said to senior staff, ignore those summons, we'll send a minister along. At which point the issue was taken to the floor of the House of Commons and the opposition parties outvoted the government and voted in favour of the motion which they had put forward that either Rick Thies and uh, uh, Zita Astravakas and uh, other senior Liberals come to the committee, or Justin Trudeau does. The Liberals have cons continued to ignore that and instead sent Pablo Rodriguez along to uh, uh, the Ethics Committee the other day where he was being asked questions about a phone call in which he was clearly not a participant, so he couldn't really offer much. All of which is to say the Liberals appear to me to be in danger of being in contempt of Parliament. And in 2011 when that happened, uh, Michael Ignatieff subsequently called a, an issue, uh, a motion of no confidence, led his troops into the valley of electoral death, and got, came back with the worst result that the Liberals have ever, ever had. Is there a danger that the Liberals are trying to bait the opposition here, Andrew? Well, I mean, yeah, to your earlier point, I mean, yeah, that, that led to Stephen Harper getting a majority. So, you know, maybe... <laughs> I don't think any of the opposition parties, other than the bloc... Uh, are prepared for an election. Um, if you believe, like what you were saying earlier about that abacus poll, every single thing is negative for Aaron O'Toole, like beyond. Like, great job spending a million bucks, guys. Um, but uh, you know, I also think that your average Canadian just heard what you said in your preamble and said, what's that have to do with me getting vaccinated and why are you talking about this? Right. If they were awake. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, listen, I, I, I feel like this is like when you're making uh, beef stock and you think you can squeeze that last bit of juice out of the bone and it's just dry. Like, I don't I don't honestly think your average Canadian sitting around worrying about the wee scandal or whether or not, you know, the political staffer should testify. I mean, I do I do find that Pablo Rodriguez, it was a bit obnoxious. There's no question that it's pretty contemptible from just a de democratic perspective. But I don't think the Liberals see any downside to just doing what they're doing. But I, I mean, I guess it was, in their eyes, maybe a pretext for, 
for an election if they were in a position to want one. It would seem to me that with the, the third wave really hitting, particularly Ontario, um, all thoughts of a spring election must be off the table, no? Well, but I mean, all, that's also the absurdity that the Conservatives motion last week, which they continue to perpetuate on social media all week about how they're demanding a opening plan and their premises that everywhere else in the world is reopening and these lockdowns are crazy. Well, the Conservative Premier of the largest province just shut us down for 28 days and like we look around the world and there's lockdowns going on everywhere and these guys are saying open up, open up and much to the similar point that I made earlier about the long-term care, I mean, and your average Canadian doesn't understand which level of government is responsible for what, but trying to suggest that Justin Trudeau is responsible for lockdowns in Ontario is as dumb as we can get. Just to add to my confusion, did he actually say no patios? Yeah. Yeah, so apparently I can uh, waltz into a clothing store and browse, but I can't sit on a patio with friends like you and have a beverage so that makes no sense to me (laughs) that is tragic what a tragic note to enter easter weekend on anyway everybody stay safe and uh we'll do it all over again next week take care cheers guys